My guest today is Richard Welch. I'm a United States Army veteran. I'm a 21-year oil and gas professional. I've worked all three streams of oil and gas, up, mid, and downstream. I've refined gasoline, made plastic, pushed uh, natural gas all the way up to New York, kept chickens warm. And I've also done a little bit on the upstream side as well. I'd like to think I'm, I'm pretty well versed in oil and gas and I'm trying to fight back against the government, to overreach into our oil and gas sector and, and educate people on just how much we need oil and gas and what all comes from it. And for us on the outside, can you talk just a little bit about what you mean by up, mid, and downstream? Yeah, so upstream is fracking and drilling. Midstream is pipelines. And downstream is, that's where you make diesel and gasoline and you make the the products from oil and gas in, in the petrochem environment. Okay, and you've been in the industry for 21 years and working for lots of different companies, right? You have a, a very broad background, I guess. Yeah, I've, I've worked for Fortune 500 companies all the way to mom and pop startup companies trying to help them get a good foothold in oil and gas and be successful. And then you're going to talk about running for Congress and about writing legislation, right? Well, so I don't, I just ran for, for your United States Congress. I'm not quite sure if I'm going to throw my hat back in that ring. It's a, it's pretty brutal environment. It takes millions and millions of dollars to do it. And I think maybe my life choices and experiences is better suited for oil and gas advocacy. And right now, though, you're working on writing some legislation? Yes. So I wrote House Bill 3661 here in Texas. It's going to force the banks here in Texas to disclose whether they use ESG practicing or philosophy in their loan making decisions for all businesses. And they're going to have to report that to the state comptroller, which has already said, we're not going to have ESG here in Texas. And you mentioned the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, which I can't believe I have not heard of that, but that's lurking in the background here, isn't it? Well, so not many people have heard of Glasgow because they keep a very, very low profile. Yet they're less than two years old as a, a, a business. And they have $130 trillion worth of financial backing already. And so if, any, if everybody thinks BlackRock is the, the big evil bad guy, let's put this into perspective. $130 trillion is more than the GDP of the top 30 countries on the planet combined. That's a pretty big strong arm. And the net zero push is the biggest push on the planet right now. It's, it's bigger than anything else. There's more money behind it. And it's a total scam. Yeah. So just since you mentioned it, I pulled up the website here. It says Michael Bloomberg and Mark Carney are behind it. Then there's one sentence here that does not sound good to me. Quote, every company, bank, insurer, and investor will need to adjust their business models, develop credible plans for the transition to a low carbon, climate resilient future, and then implement those plans. End quote. I don't like the sound of that at all. I bet you don't either. Yeah. Right. But if you look on there as well, Mary Shapiro, she was the former head of the, the SEC right here in the United States, and she's on that board, too. So, I mean, that's how they're getting all of this financial backing. The, the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission, no doubt, has a lot of pull on Wall Street, has a lot of pull around the globe, and they're just gobbling up money for this decarbonization of the planet. How do you think this is going to fly if the banks start getting into a major financial trouble, runs on the banks and all that type of thing? Well, I mean, hopefully the Ponzi scheme that's developed with this Glasgow, you know, hopefully they start trying to trickle down some money into all of these failures like Silicon Valley Bank. They had, was almost one third of their investments were in failed green energy startup companies that went bankrupt. And so, I mean, they went under and, and nobody wants to talk about that. Can you tell me again in detail what your bill does in reference to the ESG? So it makes these banks disclose to the, the state comptroller whether they use ESG policies in their, their lending practices. Also, if they put it in 
at any time in the future or take it out. So it fully tracks all of the, the ESG movement inside and, and out of these banks here in Texas. That's what you need in order to get rid of it. First, you have to identify it. And then that, that way you can get rid of it. You can't just shoot bullets in the dark and, and hope you hit something. The state comptroller has already identified the major players like BlackRock. BlackRock can't come into Texas and with their ESG policies and, and do any type of business in Texas for that matter. So this is going to get those smaller banks that BlackRock funds with all of their ESG nonsense and is going to get it out of Texas. That way we can eliminate all of this corporate discrimination based on your carbon assets. And do you have a lot of people on your side working with you on this issue? Oh, I, I have several CEOs, VPs, CFOs of, of the oil and gas companies. They can't back me enough. They're, they're great ind individuals. This also affects even the local pool company that has ammonia and, and things like this, fertilizer companies, your lawn guys out here. I mean, this is affecting everybody and it's, it's making it extremely difficult because a lot of these banks want them to go to a third party ESG rating company. These little pop-up companies are, are, they're coming everywhere. I mean, I saw like five of them within a 10 mile radius of me pop up just in the past week. These banks are wanting these ESG scores, these ESG credit scores, so that they can charge them a higher interest rate on the loans. They're little companies, these, these startup companies, yeah. they're these green startup companies that are being developed with taxpayer dollars. All this money is coming from us, from the Biden administration to decarbonize the, the planet. And uh, I forget what the specific bill, it, it I don't know, it was like $100 billion or something like that went to all of this. But basically, you know, they're, they're giving the money to banks to loan for these startup companies, and then they're turning around and failing. But so they're, they're feeding their own by, by giving these people business, saying, well, you're an ESG, so why don't you give this company a credit score, make them pay you for it. And so that way they're, they're trying to stay in business that way. Could this be a flood of money already from the Inflation Reduction Act that quick or no? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's, it's already pouring in. If we can eliminate the, the discrimination being practiced by Texas banks, then these local ESG startup companies, of course, there's no reason for them to be here. They're going to go under and disappear. What do you think is the level of popular support there in Texas for ESG that people think this is a great idea and we're going to prevent bad weather and all that? Are people well, buying not that? From, not, not from the people that I've talked to. It's, it's a bullying tactic is, is all it is. And you know, these companies don't understand why one day they can get a, a good subprime loan and the next year they're being charged three points over prime for the same type of business loan, just based on a lot of these banking practices that all this is is from the federal government is is allowing these banks to to discriminate so why wouldn't they try to cash in on the game yeah so i'm trying to understand what's happening here so what would you have to do if you just have a, an ordinary company i don't know if you're raising chickens or something what do you have to do to get a cheaper loan you have to buy carbon credits or something or what do you have to actually do to get the blessing of these people well, I mean, you're going to have to to find a way to to lower your carbon score, your ESG social score. You're going to have to buy from other low score companies based on this this network, you know, of, of other people with favorable credit scores. Because I mean, if you're mom and pop chicken ranch and you go and buy from Joe Schmo Fertilizer Company that doesn't care about ESG then you're, you're going to get a high score for not participating in the program. And that's how these things work. BSG is environmental, social, and governance. So it might not just be carbon, but it could be like diversity on your board or something. That's part of it also. I haven't seen anything like that. So these things, the social part of it is the environmental responsibility. Are you using recycled paper, things of this sort, anything and everything that you can do to, I guess, what they say is helping the planet. 
nobody even knows all of the things that goes into this. It's a pay as you go. We'll make up the rules as we we go further into this type of racket. Okay, I'm just looking it up here. I think Elon Musk said that the S in ESG stands for Satan. There's, I think he's had one or two tweets about this where he is very much against ESG. That absolutely, yeah. absolutely, because ESG hurts him as well. Tesla deals with rocket fuel. They deal with metals. They deal with mining. A lot of these things that Elon Musk has his hand in is not not exactly ESG friendly. So it, it really hurts him the most here in Texas as as being a green energy. He probably has the worst ESG score of any other green energy player in the game. And I mean, he's he's probably doing the best with Tesla compared to a lot of these other electric car manufacturers. And he's still being heavily penalized. So that's why he he calls it Satan. Have politicians been running on an ESG platform or has it been put to a popular vote much? Or it seems like to me that it hasn't been voted on directly. It hasn't yet. I mean, this is still amongst we, the people and and politicians. They don't want to touch it with a 10 foot pole. Because if you do something to address ESG, then you're going to get just major pushbacks, especially from the banks. So everybody's going to have to kind of wake up to what's happening. And a lot of these oil and gas friendly states are going to have to jump on board and nip this in the bud pretty quick. But no, this isn't politician friendly. They're not addressing it in Congress or in the Senate. It's going to take something pretty disastrous to happen for uh, these politicians to start addressing ESG. Do you think it might end up being a major part of the primaries in 2024, the presidential run? Do you think people will be debating that out loud or even then it'll be hidden? I think probably by that time, it's it, there's going to be a whole lot of light on ESG, especially because more and more of these smaller banks that have invested heavily in a lot of this green energy is going to take bigger and bigger hits. And if the government doesn't do something about it, it's it's just going to be trillions and trillions of dollars in bailouts. And eventually they're going to have to do something about it. They're going to be forced to address the situation if this continues. Do you think most banks are all in on ESG? Are there certain banks that are standing against it? I think most banks, they don't they don't really care. You, you take the, the local credit union down here, you know, Texans Credit Union, they don't really care about ESG. They're not a multi-state financial institution. And, and most of their, their loans are people buying houses and cars and things like that. You start getting into big regions, banks and PNC, JP Morgan. I mean, they're all in on ESG. I mean, Chase Bank is is heading in that direction. And Bank of America is definitely investing heavily in the ESG market. But again, all of that's coming from Glasgow. Okay. And I'm trying to understand that BlackRock, for example, might be really behind ESG because they can cash in on it. That's their major motivation is that they make so much money for somehow from this. Well, sure. I mean, so anytime that you can charge these. So let's let's look at it from this angle. BlackRock. Were they $22, 23000000000000 trillion is their, their financial backing power? Who is ExxonMobil going to go to when they want to do major expansions? The, the, the credit union down here doesn't have $400 billion to loan them. So BlackRock and JP Morgan and, and Chase Bank, Bank of America, these are the only banks that are big enough to be able to loan them money. So they really have nowhere else to go besides these companies and, it, and it's a racket. And so, I mean, do you really think ExxonMobil wants to push away from crude? No. Absolutely not. But in order for them to get prime loans, they have to go through BlackRock and they have to meet certain agreements. I know that one of those agreements was, let us put a, a person on your board and we'll give you a prime loan. No problem. Well, now look at how often this is happening and look at the direction 
that ExxonMobil is going. And then you could take the message from ExxonMobil and then go look at energy transfer. Go look at their LinkedIn feed or their Twitter feed. They don't have any of these people on their, on their uh, board of directors. And they're calling out ESG left and right because they can do that. They don't have to take all of this money from BlackRock and JP Morgan, people like that. I mean, they're, they're really standing their ground and, and they're starting to get noticed. So well, I wasn't aware of that at all, that Exxon had to have a green person somehow on their board. Otherwise, they would get penalized with more expensive loans. Go look at the financial advisors for Glasgow. Most of those people are on the board of directors for BlackRock, Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase. Then go look at some of the board of directors from BlackRock, JP Morgan, and Bank of America. You'll find them on the board of directors for Exxon, Shell, Chevron, Total Energies. Go look it up. I mean, it's fascinating. I mean, it's a, it's a big Ponzi scheme. I'm Maybe I'm understanding it a little bit better. So this ESG scam seems more concentrated in very big banks and in very big companies, but like the smaller oil companies might not be into it. They're not as strong armed by the big banks. Like energy right. transfer themselves are not. No, they're not because yeah. energy transfer is, is pretty financially secure. They have money to, to do a lot of their own expansions. And they're, they're not out there taking these multi hundred billion dollar loans or, or four billion dollar loans. I mean, they actually practice good, good finances and energy transfer. Again, I'm still trying to understand it like a small regional bank, like maybe my bank here in Minnesota, they might not be very much into ESG either way. Or are they also into it? Right. I wonder. Well, I mean, they they might be. I mean, but okay. that's what this that's what this bill, my my HB thirty six sixty one, is going to identify. Just how many banks here in Texas are implementing this type of investment strategy or loan strategy into their everyday business? Just how much discrimination is going on right here in Texas in the energy capital of the United States? Do you happen to know if this is written up, all these basic question and answers? Do you know, there is there a good source that people can go to, to kind of come up to speed from zero up to halfway to where you are on what's happening with ESG? There's a good, it's called ESGU, ESG University. Uh, I think his name is Jason Spice. I know he writes a fair amount of what's happening with ESG. ESG is starting to pop up in schools to, to where they're teaching this practice of this governance, this new type of governance built on this, the, so, the social part of it. And, and uh, I don't even, I can't even explain it in, in the depth that he can, but I know what it's doing to the energy industry here in Texas, and it's, it's devastating. I'm just wondering if you know people who have either done podcasts on this or presentations that we could also watch, anything like that? I know, I think Alex Epstein, most people know him, Alex yep. Epstein. Yep. He, he's done a couple of segments on ESG, Jason Spice. I know he's, he's, he has the whole ESGU. I mean, he, he does hundreds of lectures on ESG, but the, the world is finally waking up. Yeah, so to ESG, you know, it's becoming popular uh, in table talk. So a lot more people are going to start catching on to this. They're really killing the the American citizen with with ESG. We can get into it because this has a lot to do with uh, solar and wind, renewable energies with with ESG, and, and that's the big push push for it. Right, is the solar and wind to get rid of oil and gas, but ESG pretty much popped up within the last six years, but it's really becoming more popular in the last three, specifically regarding renewable energy. So that's ESG started coming about to be more environmentally responsible, which led to the birth of the great renewable energy push for wind and solar. So you look at Glasgow, and BlackRock, I mean, they they don't want to really lend money to oil and gas companies. Their main investment is wind and solar. And that's the whole push for net zero. And they figured out the scheme, you know, 
how, what's the fastest and most effective way to shut something down? It's to kill the financing for it. Yeah. If you can make it as unfavorable as possible, or you can chop off the head of the snake by eliminating the funding or the means of funds, then that's how things die. So when you have $130 trillion pushing against you, I mean, that, that really sends a message and, and that should tell all of us how hard we need to really look into this and, and we need to develop a plan of how we can overcome this and make things a little bit more affordable for the average citizen. I'm curious so what you think is going on with Berkshire Hathaway and ESG, because I just saw a video where Warren Buffett was scoffing at the idea of being forced to hire a diverse board, I think, because of ESG. But they're huge investors in wind power. I'm just wondering if Berkshire Hathaway then somehow, are they making money from ESG out of this, this push for more wind power? I don't How would that work? Well, of course, because a lot of this comes from federal subsidies. And and again, that's where all of this Glasgow Financial Alliance comes from. I don't know if people even know this or not, but China has invested $13 trillion into Glasgow Financial Alliance to destroy American oil and gas and push for all these renewables. So... You got to follow the money, but ESG, Warren Buffett, I haven't really heard too much about that, but I do know that Berkshire Hathaway is a huge proponent for the wind energy. I think without all of the subsidies and all of the $130 trillion of financial backing, all of this would fall on its face. You, you look at the look at the energy grid here in Texas. Te- Texas is the leader in wind wind power in the United States. I mean, we have more wind turbines here in North and West Texas than you could shake a stick at. All it's done is raise energy prices 27% here in Texas, and it's still climbing with every single one of those wind turbines that they put up. So I don't know how people find this beneficial or if they're just trying to bankrupt people in the, the name of the planet but I think without without all the federal and money that's coming into this, it would surely just fall flat on its face. There is a great quote from Warren Buffett about wind that I want to read here. Quote, we get a tax credit if we build a lot of wind farms. That's the only reason to build them. They don't make sense without the tax credit, end quote. I think that's a pretty big admission from him. And I'm amazed that he's invested enormous amounts of money in wind power and admits that he wouldn't have done it without the subsidies, basically, the tax credits. So. Basically, I mean, we're, it's built on the back of the American taxpayer. I mean, 100%. That's the only way that it can stand is with billions and billions of, of taxpayer dollars behind it. Natural gas doesn't get those kinds of subsidies. And yet, on any given day, I mean, natural gas is making up at least 45 to 50% of the Texas energy grid despite us still leading in wind power generation. I mean, I looked just two days ago on ERCOT and wind was putting out 3% of the Texas grid. I mean, a measly 3%. And I think we have over 45,000 of those, those wind generators sitting on Texas land and it can't even power 3% of the population. That seems like a pretty bad investment either way you look at it. Getting back to the thing you said about China investing $13 trillion. Do you have any more detail about that? What did they actually do with the $13 trillion? China, they, they want their hands in the power market, in the energy market. And so you heard about the ban on gas stoves, right? That, yes. that mm-hmm. report that came out. That came out from the Rocky Mountain Institute. The Rocky Mountain Institute, if you go look through their financials, they take money directly from the the Chinese Communist Party, straight from the government. To put out this report, that's all they do is push renewable. Anything that they can put out that's bad against oil and gas, they put it out. Well, the Rocky Mountain Institute, they're all in Texas. They're all in Washington, D.C. They're all in the colleges. I mean, they, they have four of their employees working at Texas A&M right here, educating our, our engineers. 
So while China is funding all the anti-oil and gas propaganda here in the United States, they're firing up three brand new coal generators a week. And, and so they obviously do not care about the planet. They want their hand in the, in the, the energy cookie jar. And since the United States is the obvious powerhouse when it comes to energy, if they want any type of market share, they're going to have to put a dent in us, and they are doing it. Off the top of your head, do you know what is the connection between the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero and either the UN or the WEF? So if you look on the Glasgow Financial Alliance website, it says that they are pushing the United Nations mission for net zero. Says it right there on their on their webpage, and so they're they're financing everything that the United Nations not it has nothing to do with just the United States and what's best for us, but they're pushing this global agenda for net zero and and to lower CO two as well. So it's I mean that's why Europe energy it fell on its face. So the second that natural gas got cut off, Europe was in the dark. So. The same thing is going to be happening here in the United States if we don't get a hold on this and people don't start acting. Okay, I found it here. As you said, on the Glasgow Financial Alliance webpage, it said it was launched in April 21 by UN Special Envoy on Climate Action and Finance, Mark Carney, and the COP26 presidency in partnership with the UNFCCC Race to Zero campaign. So there you go. Yeah. Says so it right oh. there on the webpage. I mean, they're yeah. they're not hiding it at all. How much awareness are you seeing when you bring this up with other people? Does anybody know about it before you tell them? Absolutely yeah. not. Yeah. I mean, nobody knows about Glasgow yet, but I'm I'm working hard to bring this to light and and expose what's happening because I mean, this is just a big globalist agenda, right? I mean, everybody's pushing that way. Same way with the Paris Climate Accord. That that's basically what they are funding through the United Nations, through Glasgow, everything is tied to this Paris Climate Accord. And when Joe Biden put us back in it, that gave birth to Glasgow. And now the you've seen the green energy push more heavily almost every month. Something new was popping up with green energy. And it's it's because it it has it has the money. And, and how how one company that is not even two years old. I think this month makes two years how they amass $130 trillion worth of financial backing. I think somebody absolutely needs to look into this 100%. Where is all of this money coming from? So I'm starting to wake up to this just very recently. I don't know if you saw my podcast with Alexander Pohl or with Jakob Nordengord from Sweden. Anyway, they were talking about some of this stuff too, about how there's so many tentacles between the UN and the WEF and, and all these other globalist organizations. So at least I'm coming up to speed a little bit on this. Did you know those two well, guys sure. at all? Or I've, I've heard of the second one, but yes, I mean, you're right. The, the, the Paris Climate Accord, that's, that's all across Europe. And you have the WEF, which is all across Europe. The Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, I believe that's also based in Europe. So a lot of these globalists are coming together and they're making their, is pretty much making their own energy banking system. They're, they're pushing hard and, and who's there to fight back against the $130 trillion. Okay. And, and they've, they've seen it. They, they have professional people on their board, like the former SEC secretary, Mary Shapiro. So, I mean, they, they're not doing this with idiots. They, they've hired some very competent people to lead this fight. And, and right now they're, they're winning. Do you have any confidence that there are some presidential candidates that are up to speed on this right now and ready to fight it? I hope, well, no Democrat is going to fight back against this, right? I mean, it, it's, they're not going to touch this with a 10 foot pole because this goes right into their playbook. They don't even have to touch it. Other people are going to do it for them. And so as they can ignore it all they want, it's going to be, have to be somebody very strong to on the Republican side or even the independent side to really put their foot down 
and say, this is not going to happen in the United States. Get out. We're not going to do this banking discrimination anymore. Everybody's going to have their fair shot. But if we don't get the Democrats out of the presidency and and at least if we don't get them out, then th- this is the longer the longer a Democrat stays in power, the the more power the green energy push is going to accumulate here in the United States. Are you following at all how the resistance is going in places like the Netherlands? And I think some places in Europe are pushing back against the ban on internal combustion engines. Are you following that at all? I'm seeing some things that look like there might be some light at the end of the tunnel here. On that. I've, I've seen a lot of that, but then you have the the rhetoric being pushed even more like by California. I, I think they're still by, what is it, 2035, yes. they're looking to ban the, the sale of all gasoline engines. They're, they've already done it with small engines. So I heard now that they're trying to ban diesel powered tractor trailers from from coming into the state. I mean, it's just getting more and more wicked every time you, you look at it. So while one place is fighting back, another place is gaining ground. That, and that's why I'm saying if we don't bring this to light on a global scale, then, you know, really not much is going to change. What do you think is the best thing we can do to fight back or to follow your work or support you even? Just watch this podcast and and we need to get educated. I don't I don't I don't take money or anything like that. I'm doing all of this on my own. But you need to we need to write our our legislators. Talk to talk to your company and see if they're doing things like this. Go to your bank and see if you can get them to admit whether they are or are not discriminating against you by incorporating ESG into their their lending practices. I mean, if you have somebody in the media or things like that, go talk to them. Bring all of this stuff to light. I've been putting it out in newspapers, I don't know, probably every week for the past three months. You know, talk about ESG. I've talked about Glasgow and certainly on social media, I've, I've done it in mainstream news articles, but you still don't hear about it. It's people, they don't understand the seriousness of the power of, of what these, these companies have and these policies. I've been quoted in the center square. I've been in the Dallas Express. I was on NBC News. They, they, I talked to them for about 10 minutes, but they decided to to cut it out, but at least they they talked to me about it. Um, I've talked to legislators all across Texas. I've talked with the, the Texas Comptroller. He's behind a lot of this getting ESG out of Texas. But yeah, I think I've I've put Glasgow out there and four or five news articles. But getting mainstream media to to catch on to it, like the Wall Street Journal or New York Times or Fox News, is. It's going to be pretty difficult. So have you been in contact with some other people on my podcast or reporters like Kevin Kilo or Chris Morrison or Ross Clark? Any one of those three? Because maybe, not. yeah, I might be able to I reach out not. to them because it sounds like more people for sure need to write, write this stuff up. So that's something that's yeah, I would about abs- here. I would absolutely talk with them. Were you always skeptical of the whole CO2 narrative from the start? Or was there a time when you thought that maybe this is real and the weather's getting worse? Oh, never. Never, but I've never been uh, arrogant enough to believe that mankind could could change the weather. I mean, never, not for a second. I mean, we still haven't discovered everything on 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 the planet, and so how could we be arrogant enough to to try to change something that we know twenty percent about? Have you been following people like uh, Tony Heller or uh, reading what's up with that? Or do you have any other uh, skeptics you'd like to read their work or their Twitter feeds? No, not really. I've been so consumed in trying to get this legislation passed. And of course, I was running for office. I do. I still work in the, in the oil and gas industry. So when, I, when I'm on jobs, it's, it's pretty difficult to, to stay abreast of what's happening with other people versus putting food on the table. I got kids to raise and college is coming soon. So I've been just really trying to, to focus on myself and, and educate myself. And, and I try to read up on, on other things and other people as often as possible. But 
you know, unfortunately here lately, that's kind of rare. When you were running for Congress, did you have a chance to participate in any debates or just give speeches or anything to talk about ESG at all? Or was it uh, more focused on other local issues? No, just other local issues. I'm a constitutional guy. I love the constitution, hands down. So that's a a big thing that people want to hear about. What are you going to do for us? I talked about ESG and absolutely nobody knew what I was talking about. I mean, not a single person in that whole auditorium, I, I doubt they'd ever heard of ESG before. So, I mean, and that was just two years ago. So it's, we, we, we've got some catching up to do with, with ESG. Were you personally affected at all by the 2021 blackout? Yes. Yes. Two and a half days, I lost power. Thank, thank God I have, I have generators, backup generators. Yeah. But there was everybody in, in Northwest Harris County, we, we all pretty much lost power. Was there a lot of political fallout over that about how we got to get this fixed or what went wrong? Or did people talk about it a lot about solutions afterwards? Oh, yeah, of course. The the second that, you know, one person lost power, all you could hear about on on Twitter or LinkedIn or on the news was, oh, my God, Greg Abbott failed and Eric Hott's a mess. And the, the oil and gas capital of the United States can't even keep the lights on. And nobody wanted to talk about the 32,000 wind farms that froze up and failed in the state. And with that big front that came in, we lost easy 30% of power. So we could have kept the lights on in Texas if all of this wind power and solar wouldn't have failed us. Well, we probably could have been okay. But we had shut down so many of the natural gas generators that put power on the grid because we've been trying to replace them with the wind and solar and it took them a little while to to get things fired up. But once they finally did, everybody had power again. Did they get very far with the whole argument that global heating was the reason that it got so cold for a few days? Did people, anybody believe that? No, it was, it was more day. Whenever something really cold happens, it's always about the, the reverse argument. You couldn't keep the lights on or you couldn't keep the homes heated when it was cold. But nobody wants to talk about there's still snow in California in April. And I don't think that's happened in 32 years. So the whole global warming, people need to look at this is one of the coldest times that the planet has ever been, according to to all the studies and research. We're actually in an ice age. So I don't understand where people say global warming when, I mean, we're in an ice age. And we haven't had polar ice caps. We, the planet has been without polar ice caps longer than it's had them. So throughout history, I think we've lost polar ice caps like 11 times or something like that. And so uh, I, this whole global warming is a big hoax. And I think people really need to, to wake up and smell the coffee with that. This is just weather, but my dad is 94. He's been farming in Minnesota almost that entire time. And he said this spring is the latest he's seen kind of tied with 1965. So evidently Minnesota is not heating up too fast still. The drum I'm beating right now is against the ESG and, and trying to get people to to wake up to that. And I'm I'm still looking at different avenues to maybe fight more effectively I'm um, trying to figure out how to do that, how to how to start delivering some pretty hard punches against this. Yeah, this has been a great wake up call for me. I could see myself now digging into it and trying to come up to speed on this. So thank you for doing that. I appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely. To do this. Yeah, I, I appreciate you listening and I'm glad I could.